programs because I think that I'll have more time to be able to spend here at the meetings and then I think about what it is that would be of interest uh, to the Kiwanis group as a whole. And I've had a number of people ask me what is it that I do and one of the things that I do is talk to people and counsel them and discuss with them some end of life planning. Um, and I, as everyone, most people here know, I, I was gone for a while, moved back and I moved back to help take care of my parents. And what I learned from my parents was that they had uh, gone to Alberta Barker, who at that time was at Regents, um, because they thought that she was one of the most ethical, honest, well-informed trust officers uh, in our community. And I would say that since there were eight people that came up and said very nice things to Alberta, and, and Bill Buffington too, um, and, <laughs> and then several people have mentioned that they know Alberta, um, I, I won't elaborate other than to say that she is a well-regarded, uh, well-respected uh, member of our community. And with the changes in the tax law and some questions about investments, um, it seemed appropriate to just uh, provide an overview. She obviously can't answer a personal detailed question uh, out loud in public, but uh, it is important to have an overview of what we can or should do, perhaps, um, as we contemplate um, some choices that come in the later stages of life and um, anyway, Alberta Barker is not only all of that, but to my family, she is our friend. Good job. Good job. Good job. Well, thank you, Stephen, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, it's amazing to look out and see so many uh, familiar faces. Um, I'm truly humbled um, and uh, have uh, much anticipated uh, meeting all of you today. So. Um, I'm going to begin with, why would anyone want to create a trust? Although that's not a simple question to answer, the fact is that more and more affluent families are turning to trust-based planning for their financial and wealth management. The benefits of trust are as diverse and wide-ranging as the resources and objectives of the families that employ them. Acquiring wealth is one thing, conserving and managing wealth wisely is another. Many affluent individuals lose track of where they stand and where they're going. They either underestimate their resources or fail to make full use of them. Opportunities remain unexplored and risks go unrecognized. Financial planning and wealth management assistance are an integral part of our emphasis on helping families derive all possible benefit from their financial resources, now and through the years to come. Where will and trust provisions or other legal matters are involved, we work closely with each client's own attorney and other advisors. When a financial professional provides investment advice, one of two different standards applies. One, the recommendation is suitable for the client or two, the recommendation is in the client's best interest. To the layman, the difference in these two statements may not seem like much. To lawyers and regulators, there's a world of difference. Standard two, the recommendation is in the client's best interest, is the fiduciary standard, our standard. It requires an exercise of professional judgment. Being judged according to fiduciary standards is not the same as being able to exercise the power of a fiduciary. Two brief examples. One is balancing current and future interest. A marital trust provides current income for a surviving spouse with principal to pass to children at the spouse's death. Trust assets may be invested to maximize current income for the spouse or to target asset growth for the children. The trustee owes a fiduciary duty to all the trust beneficiaries and must strike a balance when making investment decisions. Second is exercise of discretion. A family trust includes a provision allowing for principal distributions to beneficiaries under certain circumstances, ranging from medical emergencies to education and career advancement. The trustee has the fiduciary power to determine when the conditions have been met and how large a trust invasion is appropriate. To illustrate the benefits that a living trust may deliver over the course of a retirement, 
we will take the hypothetical case of a couple on the verge of retirement. Sam and Janet have enjoyed successful careers. They have two homes, significant tax deferred retirement benefits, investment real estate, and a substantial portfolio of stocks and bonds. The first order of business for Sam and Janet is to get organized, to develop a plan for asset management as well as a strategy for generating income during their retirement years. A living trust is an excellent tool for assembling assets and developing a coherent, consistent investment plan. When a corporate fiduciary is a trustee of a living trust, investments receive continuous professional supervision in accordance with the trust terms. We use asset allocation planning to help clients balance investment risk and rewards in good markets and bad. Sam and Janet will have the peace of mind as their retirement begins of knowing that their financial resources have been skillfully deployed to provide for their financial independence. Three years into retirement, Sam and Janet had some happy news. A grandson who had moved to Europe decided to marry there. Janet had long wanted to travel to Europe. She prevailed upon Sam to expand a week-long visit to the wedding to a three-month tour of the continent. <laughs> but what about the investments back home? A word to the trust officer was all that was needed. The couple's living trust continued without interruption under the trustee's watchful eye. Sam had 15 good years in retirement, then three very bad ones. Fortunately, when his Alzheimer's became severe, there was no need to go to court to appoint a guardian for Sam to manage his financial affairs. The trustee of his living trust was already empowered to handle that. Becoming a widow was hard on Janet. Her life together with Sam had been long and happy. Generally, one is advised not to make any important financial decisions for several months after the death of a spouse in order to avoid the possibility of grief clouding one's choices. Janet didn't have that worry. With the living trust in place, she already had continuous financial management in place, unaffected by Sam's death. In many cases, a living trust will convert into one or two irrevocable trusts when a spouse dies. This approach can create significant savings in estate taxes and inheritance taxes, depending upon one's state of residence. At Sam's death, the terms of the couple's living trust converted into a marital deduction trust. Janet lived for eight years as a widow. The marital deduction trust provided for her financial needs, even as the trustees continued to manage its assets on her behalf. When Janet died, her will was published in the course of the probate process. The terms of the marital deduction trust were not made public. No one would ever learn how Sam and Janet's wealth was to be distributed unless they chose to reveal that information, perhaps through philanthropy. In this example, you can see how a living trust provided for continuous financial and investment support throughout the couple's lifetime. The couple didn't have to worry about their finances while they were away on a three-month vacation. When Sam's health declined, Janet was able to focus on Sam and caring for him knowing their finances and their bills were taken care of by the trustee. This personalized management followed them through every phase of their life, providing what they needed when they needed it, peace of mind. At death, it also provided for distribution to their heirs according to their wishes, while maintaining privacy and avoiding probate. Another example is the case of Frank and Mary. They have a son, Jason, who is three years old and recently was diagnosed as being developmentally disabled. Jason's prognosis is not good and he may never be capable of living independently as an adult. They are devoted to the care of their son and can support him financially. However, they worry about Jason's future if something should happen to them. Jason may not be able to secure and keep a job his parents understand that he will need assistance in managing his financial affairs after they are gone, but they don't know where to go for help. <coughs> parents and grandparents of a child with lifelong disability, such as autism, have a special estate planning challenge. 
on the one hand, they want to provide the financial support that the child never may be able to provide for himself or herself. On the other hand, they want to protect the child's eligibility for the full range of government support programs, including health care. Distributing assets outright to a special needs person is likely to result in a disqualification for government benefits. Completely disinheriting the child is not a good idea because government benefits alone may not be enough. Giving property to other family members may work for some families, but there are risks. For example, such assets will be vulnerable to creditors, including potential ex-spouses, should there be a divorce. The better course for many families is to establish a third-party special needs trust. A first-party special needs trust is one established for oneself with one's own assets. The assets of first-party trust must be used to repay state Medicaid agencies that have paid for medical services. No such requirement applies to third-party trusts that are created for others. <coughs> Another example is that of Jim. Jim started out as just a geek in a garage. Now they call him a pioneering entrepreneur of high tech. Jim recently sold his high tech business for a tidy sum. Tidy? No, make that huge. His vision, determination, hard work, and long hours have paid off handsomely. His focus now is on a completely new enterprise, and this focus is so intense that Jim doesn't think that he'll even have much time for managing the money he received from the sale of his business. Here's where we come in. We have an experienced team and the tools to assure Jim that his money will be looked at after properly, consistent with his investment risk reward profile. An investment management account draws upon our sources of research and analysis to manage your money. We help you avoid the pitfalls of reactive emotional investing. The buy and sell decisions that we make for you represent our independent judgment of the best course of action for your portfolio given your objectives, risk tolerance, and the market outlook. Many of you here may want to provide a legacy for your grandchildren. An inheritance might need protection from any number of dangers. Simple financial immaturity and lack of investment experience, for example. The temptations of luxurious living, addictions, attacks by scam artists, well-intentioned but poorly planned business ventures, claims by creditors, notable ex-spouses. An inheritance trust provides a barrier to financial misjudgment, even as it delivers professional investment management of assets. The trust should be drafted to suit the specific family circumstances. Incentives may be included to provide positive reinforcement to the beneficiary. The trust principle may be distributed to the beneficiary over time on a planned schedule. So much at age 25, age 35, age 45, and so on. Or upon the occurrence of specified events, perhaps the completion of a college education, marriage, or the beginning of a professional practice, for example. A trust may transform an inheritance into a lifetime resource for financial security. But perhaps the biggest, most important factor in the ultimate success of a trust-based wealth management plan is the choice of fiduciary. A wide range of capabilities is required for the effective discharge of a trustee's responsibilities. By law and subject to the specific terms of the trust document, the trustee may have remarkable power over the fate of the family fortune. Trust creators need to have confidence that such power will be exercised wisely. There are many important built-in benefits to choosing a corporate fiduciary as your trustee. For example, corporate fiduciaries treat a state and trust administration as a full-time job. That is their sole job. They have facilities and systems for asset management that individuals lack. Trust funds in our care are doubly protected, both by internal audits and regulatory oversight by state and federal officials. They have an unlimited life, while an individual may die or become incompetent. 
We bring long experience and group judgment to the job of investment management. Impartiality to beneficiaries. Uh, most beneficiaries will actually appreciate that. Sometimes it's difficult to get impartiality when um, other family members are involved. We can withstand pressure when a wayward beneficiary has to bend the terms of a trust. In summary, a revocable living trust offers long-range planning opportunities. Because we act as your trustee, you may arrange to have us take on broad responsibilities for managing your financial affairs. We provide professional management or investment guidance tailored to each client's needs and preferences. We follow the client's instructions as set forth in the written trust agreement, consistent with all applicable laws and fiduciary duties. The client stays in control. Beyond control over the trust, our clients gain better control over their lives, a type of control that only a trust affords. No one can escape the risk of an incapacitating illness or injury. <coughs> When that occurs, others necessarily must take control of your finances. A living trust can allow the trustee to act on your behalf. The trust agreement spells out the ground rules, how you want things handled. Without a trust, it's a probate court that decides who takes over in the event of incapacity through the establishment of a guardianship. In fact, that situation recently happened um, with a fellow banker. Um, her um, Parents, one of her parents became sick. They had recently sold their home um, and they had moved to uh, Lafayette to be closer to family. Um, her mother ended up having a stroke, uh, was in the hospital, um, and they had not closed on their home. They had the closing on their house just a few days later. So they actually had to hire an attorney and establish a guardianship uh, in order to be able to have that closing on their house. If they had done some planning ahead of time, either perhaps through a power of attorney or through a trust, and had the home in the trust, um, all of that could have could have been avoided. So as you see, there's many benefits, um, and I think one of the things that I've learned over the years is that um, the needs of everybody are varied, and I think that's one of the the beauties of a trust is the fact that um, it's custom; it's there to meet your needs and your own family needs. At this time, I'd like to open it up to questions that you may have. <clears throat> yes? What kind of, um, I assume that the fiduciary received some compensation for their work? Maybe you could explain that. Yes. Uh, the question is, uh, what kind of uh, compensation does the fiduciary receive? Uh, fiduciary, corporate fiduciaries uh, basically receive approximately 1% of the market value of the trust on an annualized basis. And it varies by trustee, but that's about the average. Some more. Yes? Would you make brief mention of comparing trust and wills? I, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard trust time Trust versus here. wills. Trust versus a will. Okay, uh, a trust, uh, a living trust basically you establish during your lifetime, uh, and that is, and you name a trustee during your lifetime. A will basically provides for everything at your death. Okay, so uh, a trust uh, would be to take care of you now in the event of uh, incapacity for investment management, um, but, but it's kind of a safety net. Um, I'm a, a widow, um, and when my husband passed away, that was one of the first things that I did for myself. Um, I have um, a, a couple of children, one of them locally, one, one not. Um, but it, uh, a trust basically is that safety net in the event that something should happen to me. Uh, whereas a will is provides for disposition of your assets upon death. So you can have both. Yes. You have both. Oh, you, uh, yes, most definitely. In fact, if you have a trust, you should still have a will uh, because uh, many times all of your assets are not in the trust. Perhaps you don't put a car in a trust. So, uh, yeah, and household goods, you know, those kinds of things. So in the state of Indiana, if you have uh, assets that are greater than $50,000, 
uh, then you have to open an estate. So you definitely need to have that, even pending an inheritance or you know something like that. Uh, you can have the will pour over into the trust and have the trust dispose of your assets at death, but you still need a will even if you have a trust. Yes. So for someone like myself, where most of my assets right now are tied up in 401k or 403b, actually, but how does that work with a trust? I, I, is that Retirement benefits are separate than, uh, than a trust. Retirement benefits are kind of like a life insurance policy. They have a beneficiary. And, okay, but this would be the, the 401k. Right. And, and so eventually that all has to transfer out. At death. Well, it, or when you retire, you would transfer them into an IRA. Uh, and yeah, it, it, or I spend it right. all. But your 401k <laughs> should also have a beneficiary. It, it does, but I, I'm looking at, you know, you start having to draw it out when you're 70. Or at 70 like and a half, you have to take a required minimum distribution. Mm -hmm. Distribution, and so that distribution then becomes outside the 401k. That is correct. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to deal with all this. <laughs> If you want to talk with me afterwards, I'd be more than happy to help you. Did everyone get one of these just outlines of the legal options? Okay. Um, I have uh, some handouts for you, and these are um, are basically different types of trusts. I uh, discussed the revocable trust here. Uh, also uh, discuss the special needs trust, uh, and I uh, also hit on our investment agency. Some of the others of these basically deal uh, with estate planning purposes. With the new federal uh, federal state uh, tax law changes, uh, you really don't have to worry about uh, many of these uh, unless you have more than $11.2 million uh, for federal state tax purposes. So many people used to have, I know, it is. So I, and that's $22.4 million for couples. So uh, if you have more than that, um, you know, uh, come see me. <laughs> uh, if, you, if you don't, um, you know, that's, that's fine. There are still advantages to having trust. Uh, and like I said, particularly for that safety net, uh, if you're single or um, if you have some sort of a special situation applied to you. Yes? What is the downside of a trust? The question is, what is the downside of a trust? Well, uh, I guess a lot of that has to depends upon who the fiduciary is. I, you know, I've seen some family, some trusts where they have uh, named family members uh, as trustee, and that can create fights in families. Um, one of the things I've learned, I've, I've been in the business for many decades, <laughs> so. Um, but families will fight when it comes to money. Um, and uh, even though you, you want to uh, you know, maybe have your family members involved, they certainly can be involved. I mean, you could still name them as your power of attorney and then in the event that something happens to you, it's like they can work with the trustee uh, you know, for, for your benefit. But um, some people look at fees uh, as a downside, um, I'll be honest with you. I think uh, I I don't see that as as an issue. Like I said, I I set up a trust for myself, uh, and the reason I say that is because of the professional investment management that a corporate trustee provides. Um, a, you know the the depth of knowledge uh, we have our own portfolio managers. Um, it's what they do every day, uh, as opposed to some people. You know maybe just following the market. Uh, so I think many times we actually more than pay for our trustees fee. Um, but uh, beyond that, Jim Peterson, can you think of any? <laughs> yes. What's the main value of a normal trust? 
Asset value. Okay, well, uh, again, that varies as well. Um, what does it mean? It's like in, in our department, uh, we typically will will take uh, trusts that I would say are typically our starting point is right around 200000 which is low for some trustees. Uh, if you go to J.P. Morgan Chase, it's like, um, you know, they, they want trusts that start at $5 million. So it, it varies based upon the financial institution. So... <laughs> Yes. Maybe similar to what Diane was trying to ask. So what assets can you put into a trust to, to start it, build it, or how does Okay. Uh, you can put in, obviously, cash. You can put in your home. Uh, you can uh, put in uh, any CDs, uh, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, uh, exchange-traded funds, um, you know, those types of assets. Yes. Yes. So if you start out with meeting the threshold for the trust, let's say 200000 or whatever, if it comes to that, over time, just from living, you have to withdraw money from it, and the trust value goes down. Yes. Does that mean that the relationship yeah. stops? Actually, I've, uh, no. Okay, thank you. Uh, the question was, uh, you know, over time, the value of a trust may go down because of withdrawals on the trust. So what happens at that point in time? Uh, I actually, you know, many times a situation like that would happen when an individual is in uh, ill health. And so you have to uh, pay the bills and, and take care of the medical expenses. So we continue paying those medical expenses until it gets down to the point where the individual needs to go on Medicaid. And we actually will help the family, uh, or uh, if we're the only one, uh, you know, I've actually helped people get on Medicaid before. So uh, that trust can continue uh, as, as long as need be. We're not going to abandon someone just because they're in ill health. And what's the difference between that and, and let's say, do you, do you handle wills too, or does it have to be handled through a, a lawyer? Um, well, okay, uh, no. The legal documents are all drafted by your attorney. We work with the attorney for that. Okay. Okay, we, we don't draft documents. Yes? If you're working with a financial firm like Edward Jones, do you still need a trust? If you're working with a financial firm such as Edward Jones, do you still need a trust? That depends upon your personal situation. Um, Edward Jones actually does have a, a, its own trust department. They're, um, I believe they're headquartered in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Um, so uh, that is where the trust would be handled uh, as opposed to locally. So uh, yes, you could still put your assets in a trust and they, they will serve as trustee. Yes? So I see you A certified trust and financial advisor. And what, what is kind of a, a typical credential for um, a, a trustee? It sounds like um, you need to have a lot of knowledge of law and investments. And, then there's and taxes. Ethical component. So I wonder what kind of credentials are typical or what you would look for. Uh, the question is, what kind of credentials do you look for with regard to a trustee? Uh, I think you'll find many uh, trust officers have, are lawyers. Uh, many of them are certified trust and financial advisors. Many of them are certified financial planners. Some of them may not have uh, a title. Maybe you know they've just got the years of experience in the business. Uh, but uh, with a corporate fiduciary, you, you always have that umbrella. Uh, because our department has its own uh, legal department uh, as well. So uh, there are also internal committees. Um, you know, we have an investment review committee. In fact, I've got that going on this afternoon. Um, so there's, there's lots of, of uh, oversight. And uh, again, we, we also work with the individual's attorneys. Um, 
mm -hmm. uh, as well as uh, their accountant. This is a busy time of year for us. It's like we, we work uh, coordinating all the, the tax information for it, get it to the accountants and many times even take the returns out uh, to the client for their signature and get them back to the uh, accountant to be filed. Um, so as, as well as the investment side and, and like I said, we have portfolio managers as well. Yes. What happens if an if a organization fails? Um, I, I'm a realtor, and so there was a time when we would go to closings, and you had to come with uh, with proof of your funds because the banks were failing. What happens if a, if a if uh, Yes. Uh, so the question is, uh, what if an organization fails? So trust and trust assets are actually protected by the asset, the quality of the asset that the trust holds. In other words, the trust is not going to fail. If a bank fails, then you, uh, you would uh, have uh, the, the government would come in and basically they would assign another trustee. But there is no law. You, you know how banks have uh, $250,000 protection uh, for any um, deposits on hand. So those are protected by the FDIC. Okay, so that's a maximum that on the retail side of the bank is protected. On the trust side of the bank, there is no FDIC insurance because it's based upon the quality of the asset that's held in the trust. So, you know, if you held Enron in a trust and it went bankrupt, then that trust would lose that. If you had General Motors when they went bankrupt, it's like then, you know, the trust would lose that. So, but it's based upon the quality of the investment. If the bank itself, goes bankrupt, that trust is still in place, all of those assets are still in place. If you had Apple stock 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Can I talk to you? <laughs> yes, Ross. Uh, we heard back there, uh, one of our members asked about a 401k. And of course, in today's working environment, almost everybody thinks about retirement no matter what their age is. And they all talk about their 401k. Yes. And in the, in the last 12 days, the 401k has probably jumped up a, a good deal. But your 401k is bound by the tax laws. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm not sure whether there's a taxable amount if the 401k would be put into the trust before you ha are able to take it out. Uh, is that a taxable uh, transaction? <laughs> Typically, you don't put a 401k into a trust. Yeah, well, that's what I, that's what I thought. That's what. Yeah. Uh, that's that's not something that, that you do. In fact, I, I, in a 401k plan, that's a, a private employer, and so uh, that private employer would not <laughs> allow that to even happen. Um, now, if upon retirement or when you decided to leave the company, you could roll it over into an IRA, uh, which also goes by the beneficiary. Um, and you know, one of the uh, the things that, that we're actually starting to see here um, is uh, what they call it an, an IBRAT, uh, and it has to do with the beneficiary-related asset trust, where. That trust is established and it receives the required minimum distribution every year. Uh, and it has to do, I think, uh, many times when um, the individual is concerned about the beneficiary and the fact that they may be what's called a spendthrift uh, and, you know, want to take all the money and spend it right away. And so in order to protect against that happening, they'll, they'll set up an IBRAT as the beneficiary, which is a specialized kind of trust. So, yes. Uh, Alberta, uh, I don't know how uh, up to date you are on the new tax plan. And you hear lots of things about it uh, as to what is or is not deductible. Um, one of the things that the seniors, many of whom are in this room, want to be able to do on their tax returns is to deduct medical expenses that they have. Mm -hmm. In today's day and age, those who go into retirement communities, as well as those who stay at home to be taken care of, are paying, paying a good deal in order to be a senior. Yes, and yes. Alive. And uh, 
what is in the plan today that will permit anybody to deduct medical expenses from their income tax? Okay, so the question is, what is uh, what basically what changes in the tax law affects your your medical uh, deductions? And there have been uh, changes with regard to that. I don't know what the percentage is uh, at this point in time. I believe that what they've done is they've upped the percentage. It used to be based upon seven percent of your income, and I think now that that's ten percent. I I don't bank on that. <laughs> Uh, but I'm, I'm pretty confident that that's what they've done. And haven't they, haven't they limited that sunset clause so that you can only do it for the next two years? 17, 18, 17, 19, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. They, they, what they've done is they've, they've changed um, the, the, basically the income tax uh, they lowered the income tax rates, and they uh, set all of the individual income tax benefits that will be happening beginning in February will sunset in the year 2025. Seven years out. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's 12 percent for a single person, 10 percent for a married couple. For medical deductions. Okay. What, what about charitable contributions? Can you still deduct those? No. You can. Uh, the limit is higher. Uh, it, I think it, because the itemized deduction has doubled, you have to meet that threshold. You're, you're welcome to step forward and ask some follow-up questions. As you can see, that the, the fact patterns are as varied and uh, as different as there are people in this room. I want to thank Alberto very much for her remarks. We have, we have with us, uh, this is a notepad and a pen, uh, because we at Kiwanis are serving the children of the world as you are serving your clients as well. Thank you. So um, you can keep the description of the different uh, charitable trusts. And again, I'm just going to, uh, two quick comments. So I refer people to attorneys. Attorneys refer people to me. I refer people to trust officers or financial planners. They refer them to me. There may be something in this that you picked up a nugget or two. It may have been a filet mignon and, and a lot of information. But everybody needs a plan. Whatever your plan is, it's private to you. But it's better to have a plan than not have a plan at all. And Alberta is one of the most well-respected members of our community in coming up with a plan specific to you. Um, I also want to let everyone know that for next week, it'll be a little lighter topic. Um, we're going to have the owners of Triple X Restaurant provide a hi history, a visual history and a historical narrative on Indiana's oldest drive-in. <laughs>